We are studying through uh, a leadership series on the church. And you know, I've been thinking about what, we, what we're studying here, obviously. And, um, you know, the Lord loves the church. The Lord just simply loves His church. Everything that God has done from the beginning of creation has been to call us to be his people, that we would walk with him, that he would be our God. And as the church, we know that Jesus came, took on flesh, went to the cross, and died for us. And then he established his church through the ministry of the apostles and the prophets. And here we are, the church. We also know that there is an enemy in our world. It wants to do nothing more than to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And this is why he gave us the leadership of the church. So we study this morning and look at the, the role of, of the eldership. I pray that we, we would learn and understand what it is that God's design, what is his design, what is it that he really desires from these men that serve in, in leadership. Last week we were looking at the role of the apostles and the prophets and, and we read from Ephesians that God has given to us some, some as apostles, some as prophets, some as pastors and teachers, some as evangelists, so that the church may be built up. This is something that we should never forget. Christ is the head of the church. Jesus is the head over his body, and we are the body. What my physical body does is all controlled by what's in my head, and you can debate me after service about how much is up there. <laughs> but it's what's in my head, it's what's in your head. It's the brain and the mind that governs who you are and what you do. If Jesus is the head of the church, he is, if you will, like the brain and the mind that tells the body what to do. So as his church now, we want to remember that as Christ being the head of the body, he is the beginning and the firstborn. He has risen from the dead so that he himself will come to have the first place in everything. In everything we do as the Caledonia Church of Christ, it's all about Jesus. It's all about what he has done for us and taking that love that he has shared with us to a world that's lost and dying and doesn't know how that love can change their lives. We learned last week that he has a goal for his church that we found in that passage in Ephesians 4. And this is his goal. That we would be properly equipped, that each of us would be properly equipped to do good works. That we would be growing as a body, both numerically and spiritually. That we would attain the full unity of faith. That we would have a full knowledge of who the Son of God is. And that we would attain to a level of spiritual maturity, so much so that eventually we become apparent to the world as being Christ-like. That the world would see you and I as individuals, but you and I as the body of Christ in Caledonia to be the representation that the world needs to know. You know, in a few weeks we're going to be celebrating Christmas. And everybody gets very excited about celebrating Christmas. Why? Because it is Emmanuel. It is God with us. It is that God himself became man. You and I, as the body of Christ, are the present incarnate body of Jesus to our world. Do they see Jesus? Are they experiencing his love? So to this end, to the, for these purposes, God has equipped the church with leadership. And to the church today, he has appointed for us that we would have elders that would oversee the church, and that's our topic this morning. 
So we are going to look at what the what what an elder is, and you know, and as I thought about this, you know, what what truly is an elder? Well, Christ gave that the church should have elders over the church for its growth, its development, for for building up unity. Those things that we just read about. We find that in the scriptures, the eldership is always defined in terms of a plurality. There's never just one in any local body. We find that the word elder is actually in both the Old and the New Testaments. And so we're going to start off by looking at the Old Testament. We also find that in the, when, when we come before God in, in his heavenly place, when, we, when our final days on earth are, no, are over and Jesus has come and redeemed his church, that the 24 elders will be gathered around the throne of God worshiping him. But let's take a quick look at what, what elders were in the Old Testament, because it lays a foundation for us about what an eldership ought to be in the body of Christ today. In the Old Testament, we learned that the elders assisted in carrying out the burden of leadership. You might remember where Moses was being kind of overwhelmed by the burden of leading the masses of the, of the people of Israel, and they were all bringing their problems to them. You know, John, John and George, they were, they were disagreeing on something, they didn't know how to settle it, they didn't talk to Moses about it. So and so got more food than I did. They'd go talk to Moses about it. everything that was happening among the people, three to four million people, every trivial and, and major problem that they experienced, it all came to Moses. You can see why that would be overwhelming. He needed help, and so through his father-in-law Jethro, a plan was, was made known to him where he could break the people of Israel down and, and set aside those that would be in leadership and help them with that burden. In 1 Kings, it talks to us about the fact that the elders of the Old Testament would give advice to kings. The elders were seen as being the judges of the people's disputes, and they witnessed legal matters. In Deuteronomy, this is seen where there's, there's a, dis, a dispute that a daughter was given in marriage and things didn't go well. And this, through the course of the dispute, they brought it before the elders and the elders decided what should happen. You may remember in the story of Ruth that Boaz wanted to take Ruth to be his wife. And he went before the city elders and he passed his sandal to someone else showing uh, a good, good evidence of the fact that he wanted to take possession of the land and have the benefit of having Ruth as his wife. So they represented the, the cities and the communities in legal matters. The elders performed religious rituals. Moses at one time summoned the elders of Israel and, and said to them to go and select the animals for the sacrifices of their tribes and of their families. In a very similar way, we see that elders serve at the Lord's table today. The elders played a role with the tribes as leaders of the, of the nations, of, of the various tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes. And finally, they educated the people. Moses would call the elders in and share with them God's word, and they would go back and tell that word to the people. That's the foundation whereupon eldership was, was developed. It became more, more political, to be honest with you. They sat over on, on, on seats of honor, and they, they would rule over their tribes, their families, and their, their peoples. By the time we get into the, to Jesus and into the New Testament, we see that the elders of the, of the communities were still elders and, or leaders over the people of God. In Matthew chapter 17, it says that when Jesus was accused by the chief priest and of the elders, and by the elders, he gave no answer to them. So it was the chief priest and elders of the community that were calling Jesus to account. They were holding on to the traditions of man. And that was one of the main things that elders seemed to be doing in the time when Jesus came to the earth was holding on to the traditions of the, of the religious background of the Israelite people. In Matthew 15, it says that, when so, that some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had come to Jesus from Jerusalem, and they asked him, why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? Don't they wash their hands? Why don't they wash their hands before, the, before their meals? So it was all about tradition. It was all about the past. It was all about religion. And then Jesus came. And he kind of started to break tradition. It wasn't all about everything that they had done in the past. It was about what they had been doing where they missed the heart of what God wanted to accomplish. 
When God gave the law to Moses, it wasn't about rules and regulations. It was about a description of a kind of lifestyle that God wanted them to have. And so Jesus explains in the Sermon on the Mount that it wasn't just that God said that you should not commit murder, but God wanted your heart to change so that you would not have hatred in your heart. When God is working in your life, what, is he, what, what matters to Him? Is it appearances? Or is it the core of who you are? Does God really love you for who you are? Does he want what's best for you? I believe the answers are yes. God loves you. God knows you personally. God wants a difference in your life. And at the very core, he doesn't want us to just act or pretend that we have a relationship with him or that we're doing something churchy. He wants us to be a friend of his. He wants us to have a relationship with him whereby our just spending time with him changes us from the inside. It's not just that I appear to be kind and loving, but that my heart is genuinely changed to be kind and loving. That God is transforming us from the inside out. So in the church, when God, when, when, when through Jesus, he established that the church would, would come, that we would be his body, elders were given so that the church would be protected. You know, when Jesus was on the earth, did he ever have confrontations with the enemy? Was there ever a time where he was face to face with demons and those that would, would, would deny him and try to dethrone him? Did Satan ever try to step into the gospel scene and take Jesus out of the picture? Well, let's talk Christmas. What was the decree of the king when he heard that the wise men were seeking a savior and seeking the king, new king? Did he not give a decree that all the children, should, the male children, should be put to death? Was that not our enemy trying to rob us of the salvation that God had prepared for us? Our enemy does not want you and I to thrive. Our enemy does not want the church to be strong and bold and courageous. Our enemy does not want the church to sense love. He certainly doesn't want us to be unified. He'll do everything he can to destroy the unity of the church. God could not just establish his church and then leave it out there to flounder and, and do whatever it would do by itself. He had to take care of it. And so he decreed that there would be certain men who would be godly men who would be given the charge to care for his church, to protect us from the enemy, to build us and make us strong, to be able to create with us a sense of unity and help us to, to put away our disputes and our disagreements and to help us solve the problems of life. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 7 it says, For the overseer, that is an elder, must be above reproach as God's steward, as God's representative. Why? Because it goes on and it says this, Because the overseer is entrusted with God's work. An elder is entrusted with God's work. God's work for what? To build us up, to create in us unity, to develop in us a new nature that is becoming more and more spiritually mature, so at one day he could say and look at us, you're like my son. Now, I, I, I'm not deceived in my mind to think that, that I will attain the fullness of Christ while on this earth. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. There's going to be a lot that's going to happen that day that you and I stand before the Savior and he finishes all that we are and have need of being. 
So it's an important part of the elder to oversee the church. But this wasn't given as a position of rule or authority saying that the elders could suddenly come in and do whatever they wanted to do. Their position of authority, their position of oversight was to ensure that what God had planned for the church was going to get done. That God's will would be brought forth in, in the church. Again, we, got, we have to go back to, to the more important issue. Who's head of the church? Jesus is. It's his body. It's what God wants. So our elders have to be the kind of men who will dismiss their personal opinion and their personal wants and likes so that they can seek out and do what the word of God has said that the church ought to do. Now I know in our modern day that there are, there are topics and discussions that have nothing to do with scriptural matter. And you know, sadly, that's where our enemy seems to creep in most and cause the most disunity and division. So our elders need to come in defense of the church and protect the unity of the church. They need to teach and train us so that we would have new hearts and we would give up those personal thoughts and same feelings for the good of the church so that Jesus himself would be honored. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 7 it says, the elders who direct the affairs of the church are well worth double honor, especially those whose work is of preaching and of teaching. So not only were the elders the overseers of the church, but the elders were to teach and to preach the word of truth. In the New Testament church, they didn't have evangelists in, in every local church. Most of the, much of the preaching was being done by the elders of the congregation. The pastoring, the teaching, the nurturing of the body. Those, those aspects of the church were being done by the elders. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, The overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, <laughs> and able to teach. 2 Timothy 4, it says that they should preach the word and be ready in season and out of season to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort, with great patience and instruction, why? Why should the elder be so equipped to teach? Why do children need a parent? Don't we need, as children, to have parents to teach us the right ways of life? To give us instruction between what is good and what is bad? What is right and what is wrong? So in the spiritual community, in the spiritual body, we need to have men that will lead the church in doing those things that are right. Hold fast to the word of truth, which is in accordance with good teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and refute false doctrine. It's not new that the church experiences false teaching. Even in the times of the apostles, there were, there were numerous false teachings out there. The Jewish Christians were trying to tell the Gentile Christians that they, it was okay for them to be welcomed into the kingdom of God, but they needed to be brought into the Jewish community as well. They had to circumcise all of their men and, and make them all part of the Jewish nation. There were people who were in, in, in the Gnostic society that, that were teaching that it was all about having this, this great knowledge, and you could separate the things of the spirit from the things of the flesh. And if you could do that, virtually what they were saying is, your body could do anything it wants to do sinfully, as long as spiritually you were in tune with God. Boy, does that give us freedom to get into trouble. That's a dangerous false teaching. The elders were to be devoted to prayer. The elders were to guard the church against false teachings. The elders were to serve as pastors and of t as t the shepherds of the congregation. The elders were in a position of authority. So in that regard, it's not again, it's not about having authority to do what they want to do in any direction they want to go. It was in defense of what does Jesus want for his church. It was in the idea of protecting the church from false teachings. So God was wanting the men to be in a position 
to be able to stand there and, and make sure the church was staying solid on the rock foundation of who Jesus is. In 1 Thessalonians it says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. So when we talk about authority, here's, here's the deal. And this is where we don't want it to go, to be honest with you. Because none of us in here want someone to tell us what to do. But if I start to live my life in a manner unworthy of my position as, as evangelist, if I start to do something in wrong behavior, the elders ought to come alongside of me and teach me and admonish me and exhort me to get back on track. If you're living your life in a manner that is unsound to what the scriptures teach to be a godly life, the elders should come to you and talk to you and pray with you and teach you from the word of God to bring you back in a right relationship with God. Why? Because they're authoritative, mean bullies and, and they want to crack the whip? No. Because they love you. Because there's a danger of the fires of hell if we don't honor the Lord our God. We need men who are going to say, I care more for you and your salvation than I do about you liking me. Isn't that what Jesus did when he came to the earth? I want men who are godly men who love God, who will defend you from Satan and his attack on your life. I don't want you to believe the lies that Satan is casting at you. I appreciate the song that was sung because Satan is trying to fill our minds with lies about who we are and what we ought to believe about ourselves. But there's a truth in the Word of God that tells us what God thinks about who you are. And I want men to take a stand for you and tell you how valuable you are in the eyes of an almighty God. I want men who will take a stand and come alongside me when I'm falling down and failing and will help me to take a stand and get back up. So when I stand before my Savior in heaven, I can stand there with confidence. I don't need a weak knee handle to say, it's okay, we all do that. And let me go my merry way to hell. This isn't easy, folks. There is a war for you. Don't you want men of God to stand up and defend you? Don't you want men of God that will pray for you and pray over you? Lastly here, I have that the elders are not Jesus. They have not replaced him as the head of the church. This is still his body. This is still his church. But I pray with all my heart that God fills men with it, with with a sense of, of enthusiasm, if you will, a sense of love for him that has changed their life and molded them and made them to be men who are after God's own heart. I want men like David to be <coughs> serving the congregation. We all know David was a far from perfect man. He struggled. But yet God continued to say he's a man after my own heart. He wanted to do what was right. When he found himself to have done wrong, he, he, he did what he needed to do to confess and to move forward and to change. I'm looking for men in my life who have an honest relationship with God that has failed and struggled and sinned, but knew that, they, that in repentance and confession and in being immersed into Jesus Christ that they would have a new life and I can take hold of their hand and know they're going the right direction and if I just follow them where they're going I'll end up where I want to be to me that's what an elder is it's a man that loves God so much that if I just follow where he's going I'll get there. I'll get there. You'll get there.
Well, there are a couple places in Scripture that give us qualifications of what these men ought to be. 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7 is one of those passages. And Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9 is another. It's not a direct quote, but it has all of the attributes that are, that are listed in these scriptures. So let's take a look at them together. It's on, it's on your screens in front of, in front of you here. Uh, it, first of all, it's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires or desires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. This is not to be taken lightly. Obviously, serving God in this capacity to lead His church, to, to be the representative of Jesus for the body today, and seeking to, to make sure that everything we say and do is in sound accord with the Word of God, that's a big task. There's one other piece of the Scriptures that we haven't looked at this morning, and that is the men who serve in this capacity, the Scriptures tell us, will be held in a, a higher standard of judgment. God will hold them accountable for their teaching and their preaching and their leading and their overseeing and their shepherding and their nurturing of the church. Ever want to volunteer for that task where you get held to a higher account? It's a challenge. Let's go on. It says that the overseer then, because of that, ought to be a man who is above reproach. Where accusations cannot be brought and proven true. Clearly, we have learned uh, in, our, in our society today that anybody can level a charge, true or false. But above reproach, so that the, there's, there's no evidence, there's no background to give us sufficient reason to believe the accusation. He is to be the husband of one wife. There have been many that have said over the course of the years that that is one wife in a lifetime. And it may be. But I think the heart of this is that it's, it's one man that understands the commitment of what God intended in marriage. That it is a one, he is a one woman man. He is a heart that is committed to his wife. And that isn't just means that, that he's committed to just stick by her no matter how the relationship is going, that means he's committed to that relationship to make it all that God intended marriage to be. Blessed and happy, because the Christian marriage is what best represents our relationship with God. It definitely rules out polygamy, which was common in that day. It definitely rules out a man who would marry and divorce and marry and divorce and marry and divorce. But for those who are Widowed, those that are, are single because of abandonment or of a divorce that is based on a scriptural ground, there may be scriptural credence to give consideration to that kind of man. <coughs> Why would I say that? David had his moment, remember? And yet he was considered to be a man after God's own heart. He is to be temperate, even-tempered, prudent, respectable, hospitable. His home should be an open place where people are welcome to come and receive God's grace and God's love. And he ought to be a man who is able to teach. Going on, we see that he is also not to be addicted to much wine. He's not to be a drunkard. The scripture does forthrightly condemn drunkenness. He is not to be pugnacious. Do you know anyone pugnacious? It's not a common word, is it? Just like an angry dog, pugnacious. In your face, just kind of volatile. I mean, he's, he's to be gentle. And peaceable, the scriptures say. He is to be freed from the love of money because the focus in his life now is on the things above and not the things of the earth. Going on, he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with dignity, 
And if a man does not know how to manage his household well, how will he be able to take care of the church? So we have our homes. We've got, you know, children in the home. And they're so cute. And they're so adorable when they're little. And they bat their big eyes at us and, and they get what they want and what they don't need, don't want sometimes. And then they turn 12. <laughs> Some of you are laughing because you've experienced a child who turned 12. Some of you are laughing because you remember what it was like when you turned 12. We, even before that, we start to get our own personality, right? Even before that, we start to want our own way. You tell a three-year-old not to step over the line, and they step over the line. We have that self-will. But it really becomes prominent in those teenage rebellious years. Has the man of God been able to teach and train and guide his family so there's enough love and respect that even though the child may want to express their personal opinions and desires, that they respect dad well enough to surrender to his will while in the home? Scriptures talk about not having a rebellious child. In fact, it's carried on in, in Titus about that they ought to be believing children. Children that have come to have their own faith, their own walk with the Lord. Those of you that have children that are believers can definitely understand the blessing that that is. So going on, 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 the, on our qualifications... He's not to be a new convert. Because if he is, he would likely become conceited and fall into condemnation <coughs> incurred by the devil. Here again, the eldership is about protecting the church. The eldership is about leading the church in the ways of the Lord. Do not think that our enemy is going to take his target off of our eldership. They will be right in his sights. A new convert does not have the foundation, the knowledge, the ability to take a good, strong stance and they should not be a new convert. Because the devil's going to take aim at them, and they're going to fall prey to pride, or power, or some other presence of his working, and they're not going to respect and understand that they are to serve the Lord. It will become about them. So no new converts. Going on. He must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. It's not just who he is here, it's where, who he is when he's outside of here. Is he the same man in his home and in our community, in the workplace? Going on. Titus 1, chapter verses, chapter, verses 5 through 9. These are, these are things that are a little bit different than what we were just looking at in the, in the first Timothy passage. And this is where it is added that the children are those, need to be those that believe. That the man of God also should not be accused of dissipation or of rebellion. That their children should be strong and respectable young men or young women. Next, please. Qualities that are similar in both accounts. Temperate in Titus is, is sensible. Prudent becomes self-controlled. Able to teach becomes exhorting in sound doctrine and refuting those who contradict. Not being contentious becomes not being quick-tempered. And not being a lover of money becomes not fond of sordid gain. So the principles are still the same. We need, we need godly men in our next, next cat one. And these are things that he adds there in Titus. He is God's steward, representative, ambassador. He is not to be self-willed. This is so important to men who serve as elders. It's not about them. It's about Christ. And about his church. He loves what is good. He is just and upright in his being. And he is devout and holy in his walk. According to the New Testament, the elders of the early church were first appointed. The apostles began to appoint elders. First of all, Paul and Barnabas went about appointing elders for the, for the early church. Um, Titus and Timothy were both commanded. Um, Paul, that they should also establish elders in their church and work through the eldership. But as we have testified, there are no longer apostles present to continue the appointment of eldership. We don't necessarily even, 
define the role of today's preacher as the evangelist, as at least as what the Bible would declare it. Most of what we define as being the preacher minister position is, the, is more like the pastor elder, pastor shepherd position, which is the work of the eldership. So, how do we get godly men in the church today? How do we find the men who are still after God's own heart? These are going to be the men that we recognize because they're already doing the work without the title. These will be men who are solid in their knowledge of the Word of God and they are apt and able to teach. These will be men who are already actively going out into the body of Christ and nurturing them and sharing with them and caring about them in the Lord. When you consider, today is our last day to put in your nominations. In a few weeks from now, we're going to be making our decisions. I ask you and implore you to make your decisions based on God's holy word. That we seek and find truly godly men to lead us forward. Not, that is, that's not a represent, we're not there now. It's just that we need, that's, that's where we need to stay or where we need to be as we continue to do God's work. The modern church has come to a position, especially in America, of democracy. That we vote. It's not a popularity contest, you guys. It's not about who you know the most or who you see here the most often. It's not about who's a friend and who's not. If Jesus was present, who would he choose? If the apostles were here working with us, who would they choose? I've committed to our current men serving as elders, that I'll be taking time in the next several weeks to talk with everyone that's nominated. If you don't know these men that will be nominated, that we make known to you, get to know them. Find out who they are at the core of their being. Make a right decision. Because these men are the men that we're going to grasp onto their hands and say to them, I trust you with my life. These are men who aspire to a position to say, I'm willing to take that responsibility. Together, we will end up in heaven. Together, we will touch lives and change lives in our community and see Christ glorified through the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your instruction. I thank you for having determined that the church is in need of men to, to lead us and direct us, to shepherd us, to nurture us. We have an enemy that wants to defeat us and keep us down. We have an enemy that wants to hinder the work that you've given us to do. Give us strong men who love you. Who will pray for us. Who will live as an example before us so that we can know how to live ourselves. Who will care enough about us to come into our homes and into our lives and share your word so that we can be godly men and women. I pray your will be done as we select those who will lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn this morning is 483. If you'd like to turn with me there. You know, I don't know necessarily of where you are in your life. We've all had leaders in our lives in some direction or another. People that have led us here or there and shown us what, what is right, what is wrong. Maybe this morning you're, you're in here and you're, you're with us and you've never really had somebody lead you to talk to you in such a way that it really is a matter of between life and death, between heaven and hell, about a life with Jesus or no life at all. If you need to make that decision, 
We're singing a hymn that's called Savior's Waiting. We ask you to consider that prayerfully and step out if that's a decision you need to make. Let's stand together.